All right, here we go. Here we go. What an exciting morning. We got a panel for you. A great follow-up to James, absolutely spectacular follow-up to James, a panel about Google and election interference. Uh, to introduce our panel, I'm bringing out Connie Elliott, who has the best hair of any of our speakers, I'm telling you. Please welcome to the stage, Connie Elliott. Look at this, amazing. Here you go. Wait, 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 wait. See that? Good morning. Societies which require a free flow of information become prey to those entities which have an interest in the formation and flow of that information. With control of 90% of desktop search and a third of the digital advertising market, Google is just such an entity. How does Google manipulate our elections? A better question would be, how does Google manipulate our decisions, right? Um, and today on this panel, we have four people who've picked up a lot of expertise in figuring that out. I have for you Zach Voorhees, who walked out of Google, blowing the whistle on them by carrying out 950 pages of Google internal documents, which he gave to the Department of Justice, working with James O'Keefe at Project Veritas. I have Joel Coulter, who as chair of the Department of Defense's Joint Human Interoperability Enterprise Committee, say that five times fast, uh, and as leader of DOD's Group Wear Technology Initiatives, got sucked into an earlier attempt to apply these technologies to a political space, and that was the Arab Spring. Next, I have for you Patrick Ryan, who is a researcher who has spent a very good deal of time trying to understand these systems and maybe how to confuse them some. And so with that, I give you Zach Voorhees and a remote. Testing, testing. All right. Um, hi, my name is Zach Voorhees. Um, James O'Keefe just uh, talked about me with the uh, Google leaks. Um, and I want to tell you about what Google does to whistleblowers. Um, right before we disclosed Google's 950 pages of their detailing their censorship regime, uh, Google called in a wellness check. And This was after about an hour standoff of just me not answering the door. Um, the police decided to call in a bomb threat because it was a tin can by the gates. Um, they shut down uh, Valencia from 20, 20th to 22nd, evacuated a theater next to me and all the stores, and then I decided that uh, it might be better to come out with everyone filming rather than wait for them to come inside. Um, what was it that Google was so scared about? It was a program called Machine Learning Fairness. To understand machine learning fairness, we have to understand something called algorithmic unfairness. And what Google thinks is algorithmically unfair is search results that don't represent a fair and equitable state. So one of the things that um, Google has defined in their internal documentation is can objective reality be algorithmically unfair? So let's say that you're doing an image search for a CEO, and the results are mostly men that come back. Even if this is an accurate representation of objective reality, it can still be classified as algorithmically unfair and justify intervention via product intervention. The result is what you see here. Uh, such search prediction results include men can have babies, men can have periods, and when you do the search for women, what you get is women can fly. Um, hands up, how many of you women can fly? 
Um, so the question that I started to, to ask myself is, why is Google doing this? Why are they intervening in their search results? Why are they intervening in their Google News? And I think I found the answer in some of their slides. I'm gonna let you be the judge, though. So first, it's a four-step process. So first, Google collects training data. They then feed this training data to generate these machine learning algorithms. These algorithms are then applied uh, to content so that they can classify them. This classified media is then boosted or deranked. And the end result is people like us are programmed. These are Google's words. This is an actual slide. And it can be found in the disclosure that I did through Project Veritas. Now you may be thinking to yourself, well, maybe this is just one slide, but in fact, it exists in other ones as well. This is what we call a generalized filter bubble or an echo chamber. And this process repeats over and over and over until society becomes a more fair and equitable state. Now, one of the interesting things is that this machine learning fairness really ramped up uh, starting in December of 2016, immediately following Trump winning the 2016 election. And from 2016 through 2017, it really went into high gear. Um, let me allow the CEO of YouTube, Susan Wachowski, to tell you about how they're going to boost and derank news. Uh, this is from the stream event in 2017 of June. So what are we doing? Um, basically, this sounds easy, but it's really hard to do. We're pushing down the fake news, we're demoting it, um, and we are increasing the authoritative news and promoting it. Um, how do we do that? Um, we have a whole system. We came up with trashy news where we have build classifiers, we identify it, we look for salacious, for clickbait, content that isn't, um, that we don't think is, is uh, you know, the authoritative news. It's just kind of encouraging people to look at, but it's not true. Um, we're training, we added these instructions to our tr um, raters, and we've updated our classifiers, um, and we are working to understand, identify that with machine learning, and then to push that down. Okay, so they're going to boost authoritative content, and they're gonna take the fake news and the trash news, and they're gonna push it down. So in order, to, in order to understand what fake news was, I dug in. And what I found was that some of the things that they were listing as examples of fake news were actual news events that happened. And so I started to realize that maybe this wasn't about fake news, maybe this was about controlling the narrative. Um, this is an example of what Google thinks is authoritative. So at the top of the list, you'll see the Wall Street Journal, uh, in the middle is Fox News, and uh, towards the bottom is Breitbart News. Um, this next part might be a little triggering. Um, I want you to keep in mind that I believe that there's a lot of good people at Google, but some of the people aren't thinking quite clearly, and they might be doing a lot of damage with the things that they do, and I think that, um, I think that we need to, well, I'll just show you. This is, so there was an attempt at Google, and they coordinated with Sleeping Giants uh, in order to kick Breitbart uh, off of the ad networks. So these are actual quotes. Um, the first person says, anyone want to hold their nose and look through Breitbart.com for hate speech? Someone else answers, hate is really difficult since writers have become very artful in demeaning other groups without being explicit about it. That said, do review BART BART phases against our hate policies, and we have stopped showing ads on policies violating pages we found. We're working to improve our ability to do this at scale. When sufficient violations have been found, we'll take action at the site level. 
what that last sentence means is that they're going to take the whole page and kick them off the ad networks, essentially cutting them off from a mainstream of revenue. Um, Google has a 24-hour crisis response team that monitors all the different news corpuses within Google and through Twitter and through alternative news sites. And what they do is that they identify trends that are happening, they figure out which signals to boost and which signals to uh, attenuate and push down and derank. Um, what's the result of this? Well, this is one result. This popped up right after the October 1st Las Vegas massacre that happened in 2017. Um, of the YouTube query blacklist, 20 pages are dedicated to, uh, uh, to blacklisting content related to Stephen Paddock um, and trying to strengthen ties between him and Trump and trying to break the association between him and the DNC. Um, this next thing is a really interesting story. A lot of you have probably heard about the word kafefe. Um, so let's go back to May 2017. Uh, Donald Trump gets back from Saudi Arabia and he makes the following tweet, despite the negative constant press, kafefe. Um, so um, Kefefe is interesting because it actually translated on google.translate.com, translate.google.com. And people discovered that the word would translate to, we will stand up. So people were saying, aha, we've decoded the tweet. It says, despite the constant negative press, we will stand up. Well, the New York Times said, actually, this is nonsense. And they wrote this hit piece. Um, a day later, on June 1st. And they said, actually, it doesn't mean anything. And the person that they used to justify that it meant nothing uh, was somebody that had previously worked for the New York Times. Um, and so Google took this article and created a design document to eliminate the word from the Arabic translation dictionary. Okay. And what's interesting about this is the name of the team that decided to do this. They called themselves the Derrida team. Is anyone familiar with the French philosopher by the name of Jacques Derrida? Some of you, yes. Um, he was the philosopher that advocated for the destruction of Western culture through the manipulation of language. I think it's very interesting that the name of the team responsible for censoring this word was the same name as this philosopher. So I'm sitting here and um, I'm noticing that the media starts, you know, this is, this is a few days later, the media s takes, you know, this tweet and a bunch of other reasons and they start advocating to remove the President of the United States by invoking the 25th Amendment. And, you know, Google really treated me well. I had a really great job. I was a senior software engineer. Um, all the things that you heard about Google with the free lunches uh, and the massages, they're absolutely true. You know, Google really treated me well. But I'm sitting here looking at this stuff and I'm asking myself, is this sedition? Is, is this collusion for a coup attempt? What exactly is going on here? Because it seems that the media might be colluding with Google to remove the President of the United States. And if I don't do anything about it, then I myself am complicit. And so I had a really hard decision to make. And ultimately I realized that I had to do the right thing. And so I decided that I was going to bring this information and leak 950 pages, and I was gonna leak it through Project Veritas so that the American public could know the reality and the truth about the largest tech company in America.
welcome. Um, the, the thing is, is that what I've realized through this process is that if you don't have a free market of ideas, then you don't have a free market of commerce. And so what I want to finish off with today is a, health, a, a sector of the economy that's being absolutely destroyed right now. A lot of us know someone that is in the supplement or alternative health like ecosystem. And I want to show you what's happening right now to this market segment. Um, around May, maybe even April, Google decided that they were going to um, team up with Big Pharma. Uh, many of you may not know this, but Google bought a bunch of pharma companies, one of them making a master vaccine. Um, and what they started to do is they started to promote authoritative content and push down alternative health that is centered on nutrition. Um, we saw this, they've changed it since I've disclosed, but this is what it used to be uh, when you did supplements. Um, they were pretty much all bad. Um, I've noticed that in their blacklist, they've uh, censored things like cancer cure, so that videos talking about that don't appear in your search results. And this is what censorship looks like to an industry. Imagining having nearly two million unique views and then having that go down to 5% of that. Um, Dr. Mercola, he, his article view count went down to less than 1%. Okay, this is the power of Google. And the thing is, is how can any one of us as entrepreneurs enter into a marketplace if a tech giant in one day can flip the switch and destroy you and destroy everyone else in that market sector. We can't have prosperity, we can't have a free market if a company like this can just destroy entire sections of the economy at will. This is incompatible. And the reason why I'm coming here is because I ultimately want you to be happy. I want you to be prosperous and I want your children to inherit the same kind of free America that I was able to inherit. So um, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a big problem. Um, and I am happy that I'm on the other side. Um, I, and, and, I, and I hope that by exposing this, we can start to come and have a discussion about what we're going to do uh, now that we know this information, um, because we, we do not want to have the Chinification of America's marketplace. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, please follow me. Um, I'm fighting giants. Um, come follow me on Twitter. My handle is Perpetual Maniac. Thank you very much. Okay. Joel. Wow. Hello, y'all. I uh, met Connie a few months ago because, and I met Zach. And I had been working for a while with the government on social media and data fusion. And whether y'all know it or not, back in the 1960s, there was a thing called neuro-linguistic programming. And you had your old TVs, and you had subliminal messages in the ads, and you wanted to go eat what the thing was telling you to eat. Well. Sergey Brin, have y'all heard of the Highlands Forum? Anybody here? Well, the Highlands Forum, Sergey Brin was in Stanford, and the Highlands Forum was a like a Davos group of defense and intelligence people. And they got, Sergey Brin was working on a web crawler, the first data mining tool. And they embraced him what was called the Digital uh, Data Sciences Massive Institute, and they did, and they added Perception management, perception management. So during that time, I was doing global e-learning. I was trying to teach people and have the same experience anywhere else to learn. Well, after 9-11, neuro-linguistic programming got brought into the government and got approved by the defense and intelligence community throughout Oak Ridge National Labs and a Dr. Brown. If you've ever looked up 
YouTube, look up Darren Brown, and you will see everybody in a mall raise their hand in concert. So that kind of cognitive control really started to concern me, and I was walking out of Joint Forces Command. I'm just a serial entrepreneur, disruptive technology, and the OSD CIO said, well, I want you to join this Human Interoperability Enterprise Committee, and I want you to meet doc Dr. Brown. So she drove up in a red Ferrari, and I'm like, well, wow. And they wanted me to be the outreach chair for this huge thing, and so my title of my slide is from Internet Learning, Commerce, and Entertainment, because I think we all had a positive mindset about the internet and connectivity and freedoms, and then what it has become is more internet information and cognitive dominance led by Google. And I know this because they were behind the scenes when I was working on, let me look at real fast. So again, this is just talking about back in the 90s, we had a whole thing called groupware technologies. People collaborated in organizations. And when Google was created, all groupware went away. They, they redefined the word collaboration to just sharing. And about that time, uh, you ever heard the book called Big Moo? That means give it all away for free. Give it all away for free. And then, of course, the open source movement started about that time. And then, you know, what was really weird is that in 2005, China and Iran walked into the World Society of Internet and said, we want the U.S. to give up leadership of the Internet. And every country walked out with China and Iran in 2005, except one, and that was Israel. I ended up doing a telecom broadcast about 147 countries about why in the world would you ever follow China's internet and telecom policy. But guess who has? Who has just recently gone to China to work on AI and machine learning and left our country? Google. I was like going, have they lost their mind? What are they doing working in China? And again, so I was in a group, the human, we, again, right now that we group disbanded in 2010, and we brought technologies from different countries to do a lot of data fusion data, all kinds of data dissemination, but it was more for humanitarian, and I thought humanitarian early warning save lives. And what it ended up becoming is the Worldwide Human Geography Group. You can look them up. They put all the human stuff into maps, and they aggregate. And they are doing, they're using persistent situational awareness to control even that. How many have heard of the deep fake? So they're not going to silence you. They're going to manipulate you. They're going to make you say that you, you know, you're, they're going to just totally transfer what you, you're about and put you into a, when they say the global values. You ever see, how many people have heard the word global values? I can't figure out what that is. And what got me started is when, uh, unfortunately, somebody said the One World Order back in 1990, and I'm like, going, what? So anyway, I got involved in Evergreen Aviation, which was an interesting company, but they went and went to the UK. And what really, re this is what really made me see the power, is Mr. Carp owns Palantir. So all of a sudden, the Army came out and said, no one's to use Palantir, it can't scale. Well, the next day, $240 million went to Mr. Carp from JSOC. Now, that wasn't the end of the story. Guess what happened next week? He walks into the Bilderberg Group and becomes the coordinating chair of the Bilderberg, where you have Google DeepMind and George Soros' Open Society, right? So if you ever go on LinkedIn, look up the Open Society Foundation, go down the people, you can track back to China. So this is the kind of things a group of five biased countries worked on, net enabling the social cognitive domains by the internet domain. Google is embedded in this. They're the ones who took this from the government, and it's really scary. It's not just about search. It's about cognitive control. 
And when you see this, part of the massive data mining process, they've done all this. It could be a market thing where you're trying to look at markets, but what it really is, is control. Not empowerment, control. Take away your freedom to control because they believe in their mind that this is more stable and a peaceful world than to have freedom and freedom of expression and freedom of association and freedom of collaboration. So just another picture. So what's amazing to me is how rapidly Google and Facebook have formed these social trusted networks and everybody goes to them. And you know what? It's through the mobile device this is, you're addicted on. They've got all our kids addicted on these mobile devices and they're just not going deep. They're being manipulated. And there's all these things, considerations I'm not gonna go into, but when you get into human and machine, robotics, and all this stuff, when all this media's aligned with most of the main media to Google, it becomes a almost total mind control. And as Dr. Um, he, we wished he was here, but uh, he announced that he said 30 to 50 million votes could be controlled by Google. See, they thought Hillary was gonna win last time. Guess what? Had they thought she was gonna lose? I don't know if Trump would, Trump would have won because they already had the technological capabilities to do this back in 2016. But, and I want you all to come next, I'm, I'm here with um, uh, Tom Goldberg, he's gonna talk about China because this is where it really, really, this is the future if we don't stop this. China has a one belt, one road initiative, everybody's heard about that. But they also have a digital road with Google, and that is where they combine telecom, AI machine learning, drones, because they do really, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a robotics guy too, drone and social justice all into one. So right now, I promise you, people in Silicon Valley are working on the next gen social justice dashboard. And if we do not reelect Trump, I guarantee you we'll start seeing social justice dashboards in this country and then, I hate to say it, between that and the drone stuff with China, they could manipulate all situational awareness data. And the school, what the schools have already been, as you know, they teach the whole total social, socialism, but you're gonna have control of all situational awareness. And the deep fake where you, they show you saying things you're not, you can't believe you're saying because you didn't say them, they just manipulated your voice and everything else. Okay, so again, we can talk about this later. I, love, I look forward to talking about how do we resolve this because we have to stand up to this. It's not just about political. We have to stand up to this and we have to basically break up this oligarchical Silicon Valley that is basically in bed with China. That's my, thank you much. All right, now I need, hi. Now, I need the AV guys to tell me if, um, well, we might have a little surprise for you if the AV guys tell me that we have him. Guys, do we have Michael? Negative? Oh. Oh, yes? Give me just a second and you're about to get a mic. All right. So next I have for you Patrick Ryan. Hi, my name is Patrick Ryan. Um, I identify as an AI warfare specialist. <laughs> Sounds really pretentious, I know, I apologize. Um, but there's a lot of action we can do here. I got into this because I never appreciated the narrative about AI. It's always sold as some monolithic force that's gonna steamroll over us and the only thing we can do is just lay back and accept it. Even Elon Musk touts this and you know that never really sits well with me. I, I like to get involved, I like to be active, I like to kinda see what I can tweak and kinda chip away at that Goliath. And so I came up with a bunch of strategies, uh, technical and political, on how to do exactly that. And I wanna share them with you because I believe once you understand how to think about AI, it's so simple, you'll come up with the answers yourself. I won't even have to tell you. Um, so how am I involved with Zach? 
So I, my research gets published every so often. I put it on my blog. It's coltstate.com. It's a weird name, I know, uh, but there's a reason for it. And on there, I started looking at how Google was doing what they were doing with AIs in particular. They weren't manipulating people directly. That's too expensive. It's actually easier to collect what people are giving you and then make modifications to human behavior and then watch what they give you back. It's an iterative loop. So the information you're providing is collected entirely from your cell phone for most, I mean, nowadays at least. It used to be from your web browser. It used to be from secondary data, from government sources. But the, the cell phone is really the holy grail because you can provide you can gather so much information from it, including information you would never even think is valuable. You, you might think in terms of, well, it's collecting my face, it's collecting my voice. Yeah, it was able to figure out who you were psychologically without that 10 years ago. How did it do that? How is that even possible? Well, I've personally, with my own eyes, seen technology where you can swipe your phone once and have an extremely high confidence interval that I know your race, age, and gender from one swipe. Just from that, how is that possible? Well, it's very simple. When you have hundreds of millions of people with cell phones and they're all swiping their phones all the time, that's a tremendous amount of data. You start to see patterns. You start to see, oh, well, this race of people swipe their phone this way under these circumstances. And this gender swipes their phone this way under these circumstances. So you can start identifying people by their demography and eventually from there springboard from that to figure out their psychology. And you can collect this from all sorts of innocuous data sources, including accelerometers in your phone. Think about it. If you put your phone in your pocket and you walk, guess what information about you I have now? I have your gait. I can figure out how you walk. I can figure out if you have a foot problem, if you have what kind of shoes you have. I can figure out your gender because women have certain hips statistically and males have certain hips statistically, just from the accelerometer alone. So. The information you may think you're hiding, you don't even know it's being collected. And more and more of this is being collected, not even from your own phone, but from other people's cell phones that you just happen to be on. So in a sense, if you've ever seen The Matrix, it's almost as if each one of us is an agent in The Matrix, kind of snitching on each other passively without even knowing it. Not even maliciously, we, we just like the cell phone. So, what do you do about all this? This is, this is sounding rather nightmarish. Um, I'm a fan of looking through history to see if this has happened before. And it has, surprisingly. Um, this sort of collection of information is seen in Eastern Europe uh, with the Stasi, uh, Eastern, East Germany in particular. It's seen in China aggressively. Uh, it was seen to several degrees of accuracy in Russia as well. And now it's here. So. What did those people do about it that was effective? The, the unfortunate answer is not much. Um, they didn't even understand the nature of the problem. It was so far beyond them. They didn't understand the electronics collection, the neighbors telling on each other. Um, it, was, it was such a vast network of operation that because they didn't know what was going on, they couldn't do anything about it. I'm going to tell you what you can do about this. First, we have to chip away at the narrative of AI. It is not a monolith. It is not a technological monster that's going to steamroll you and you have to sit there and take it. It is something you can understand and something you already understand. It's just not been told to you. So what do I mean? AI basically means whatever you train is what you get. So how many people have children, right? How many people have pets? Has anybody ever worked on a farm with animals and anything along those lines? Each one of these scenarios, you're training. You're training your child to behave a certain way. You're training your pet to, you know, go to the bathroom where they're supposed to go to the bathroom. You train your farm animals to be farm animals. So you are, you're already engaging in this sort of model of training. So you have, Use that as your baseline to think about AI. You train the AI and then you get the behavior. And that's how Google operates about it too. So now you have a point of reference to, to go from. So no, no longer is this AI, this, this magical, 
this magical monster that only the, the technologically elite understand, now you have a point of reference to enter upon it. Okay, so let's build upon that. When the child misbehaves, you intervene, right? So you have to, you have all the previous behavior of the child and you say, okay, well, th this is bad. Let's, let's intervene and then get a different outcome. Let's uh, stop getting D's in school or stop being a bully on the block or whatever. Google does the exact same thing. They also intervene on their AI. But the problem is that they can't do it well. And they don't advertise this, but Zach's leaks demonstrate this effectively with the concept of hyperparameters. Here's what it means. Let's take, uh, let's take an idea of a friend you have, um, a good buddy you've known for a long time, and let's say we could pull this person out of your memory. Well, okay, let's say his name is Joe. We pulled Joe out of your memory, but you still have all these experiences with Joe. Maybe you've been to his bachelor party, or you've been out drinking with him, or you had fun with him. You still have memories of Joe, even though he's, he's, there's no concept of Joe in your mind anymore. You could theoretically reconstruct Joe just from those experiences alone. The same is true with Google's AI censorship. If you pull a word out of Google's AI, you didn't pull all the relationships of that word out. The AI can effectively heal itself and reconstruct the word, which means they can't even hack their own AIs to do the censorship. What they have to do is they have to say, this AI is generating a result we don't like, so we're just gonna straight up override it. So if they don't like something about a political group, a behavior, a psychological profile, they can't even hack their own AIs. They have to directly intervene. And that's very important because that means that they are showing bias directly for the 230 legislation. Now, you may have noticed that there are certain state AGs going after Google for antitrust. If you'd like to be involved politically, I recommend getting in touch with your locals, uh, the local representatives, and getting involved in the AG operation as much as you can. Um, yes, it's legal, it's technical stuff, but if you, can, if you just generate the support and show your interest, that will assist tremendously. So that's the political side of it. So let's talk about what you as people can do. There are ways, if you're technologically abled, you can spoof your metadata. So instead of, instead of the cell phone consistently uh, giving out the data that you're organically generating, your walking, your speaking patterns, and everything else, if you have the ability to hire a programmer or you have a, a child or a son or a daughter that's very technically apt, you can spoof metadata. And there's no security against this whatsoever. What this means is you could generate an, app, an application, a fake application that will generate false information about your GPS location, false information about how you talk, who you're associated with, and what this will do is Google will start to think that you're actually someone else. And they'll have no point of reference to figure out who you actually are. This means you can start demonstrating, if take myself, I'm a 37-year-old 30, white guy, I could use metadata spoofing to make Google think that I'm a 16-year-old black female. And how do I know that works? Because they'll start showing me ads that only a 16-year-old black female would see. And they can't fix this. There is no security against this type of attack. It's the, and that, at that advertising point, 95% of their revenue comes from advertising. This is how they won Gamergate, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this type of attack, if you can trick and bankrupt the efficacy of their ad networks by pretending to be someone you're not using technological tools, they're done. Their entire market revenue is over. Now let's see if I can get down from here. This is going to be interesting. Here. But I promised questions. Oh, here. Actually. Hello, hello. Hi, Marion. <clears throat> I think there was a, more okay. than one. Yep. We had a gentleman back there who wanted to ask a question. He got me first. Can I yes. ask you to help him out? And if you have any questions, we have time for one or two. Flag Miriam down. 
Okay, I just want to introduce myself, how I got to know Zach. I'm an investigative journalist in the health and wellness field, and I'm the director of the film Vanishing of the Bees, and I have been censored and deranked and lost 76% of my traffic on my health site, Honey Colony, and don't have any reach anymore. Many of us are blowing the whistle, but it's become a silent one. So, who would like to have a question? The, the, the man in the middle there, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. Joel. Joel. Jo Joel. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I found your information to be overwhelming. Um, and thank you very much. I, I, I can remember vaguely hearing a, re a report a few years ago when Obama was president that Google had a representative every week for the eight years that Obama was president on the roster list, you know, like the, the guest list going into the White House, a representative from Google. And I never heard anything else about that. But as far as, I, you know, I'm just a guy. Right. And I don't trust Google, and I'm an old guy. And, and recently, a cousin of ours, his daughter, who's a psychotherapist, says to her father, we're gonna wait until your generation is dead, and that's when we'll get what we want. And when I hear stuff like this, and I hear you telling us about everything that's going on, and what, do we, what can we do about this? I mean, you know, you call your local congressman. I'm in South Florida. All my local congressmen are people I hate, you know? <laughs> I mean, I, I, well, I wouldn't, and I'll never vote for a Democrat ever, but I mean, that's what we have in South Florida. And this is a swing state, and, and it's one corruption thing after another, and I'm getting carried away, and I thank you very much. So, so you, this is very concerning. You can see what's going on right now as this mass false narrative to take down Trump and perform a coup. So I'm also the guy that helped set up project-based learning and FIRST Robotics. We have got to get back into the schools because if we don't get back into schools and teach them evidence-based research, we need to get people to think again, not just react and be stimulated. And can I add? It isn't just the schools. We all got here on this stage through a circle of trust. One person reached out to the next who he trusted, to the next, to the next. It's slow, it's patient work, it's not sexy. But one neighbor to, one neighbor, to the next, to the next at a time. And then with our kids, start at home and teach them why you believe what you believe and give them the space to make that decision. And I think you'll find that over time, as long as you live your truth, they will adopt those values because they will honor your witness. Right. She makes it go, give them a true north. If you have a true north, Islam has a true north. This is what's really scary. If you're a country that's totally undecided, you will be totally manipulated how to think, how to behave, how to act and the social justice dashboards, if you don't do that, you'll get a low social credit score, you'll get a low financial, and you will be punished okay. for saying. We need, we have time for one more question and then wrap up, sorry. First, I wanna say thank you, Zach. Um, 41 years at Intel Corporation, <laughs> linked with Google, obviously. Um, my question is, uh, when did Google start suppressing cancer cures in mid-2016, my son passed away from a very rare and aggressive cancer. I spent hours searching and searching and searching from October of 15 to May of 16. And so I'm actually considering maybe a class action lawsuit because yes. that is horrific. Yeah, um, I'm really sorry. Um, I'm, yeah, it's really painful. Um, I've got family member that's that's uh, afflicted with cancer. Um, what I want to give you guys as a keyword is something called GC Math, um, and uh, you can look at it up in the internet. The fifth generation of this is immuno, and uh, this uh, the recovery rate is extremely high, but you cannot get it in the UK or the United States, but you can go to Mexico and get it. And if you know anyone that is afflicted with cancer or you are afflicted with cancer, look up GC 
M-A-F. So that's what I want to say. I just want to add that the medic update, the medic update 2018, and uh, Google started buying uh, pharmaceutical companies when Alphabet became the parent company. So that was 2015. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. We're going to be available afterward in the North Hall if anybody wants to ask questions, but I'm trying to help the guys backstage keep on schedule. <laughs> so uh, thank you all for coming. It is, let me just wrap up that it is really, these effects are very subtle, right? It is very tempting to say that because I see conservative content, there isn't a problem. Work done by Professor Robert Epstein for the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences show that the search engine manipulation effect is most effective far after our interactions with search engines, after we've forgotten our initial questions, after we've forgotten our preconceived notions, that their manipulation lasts in our subconscious. And yet everything we've talked about today has only barely scratched the surface of this dual use technology. Imagine for a moment what this pattern, highly accurate pattern recognition technology can do on a field of war. Experts I've talked to who have thought about these problems for a very long time have described to me a world in which something as basic as battlefield deception, as camouflage becomes obsolete. And now Google has taken this technology to the People's Republic of China. All technology developed in the People's Republic of China belongs to the Chinese Communist Party. You have to give it to them as a precondition of doing business there. And the Chinese Communist Party has spent four decades publicly vowing that they will supplant the United States as the world's preeminent superpower by 2030. A favorite author of mine once wrote that tests are a gift and great tests are great gifts, and, but to deny the test is to deny the gift. This, you've learned about this morning, is the great test that is before us, the American people. And I challenge you, how are you going to rise to meet it? Thank you very much. Thank you.